Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here, the Principal Storytelling Officer for the Histoire Source Source Story video series, a video series for Canadian history teachers, where myself or our French host get to talk with historians and archivists and curators and, and creators and artists and sociologists about one usually primary source, and we ask, what is the source? What is the story and how can teaching it with it challenge Canadian history? And that third one is so important because that is what we are here to do. Uh, challenge Canadian history, to tell new narratives, to be able to push open our traditional narratives, our colonial narratives, to be able to bring more complexity to these stories. And our goal isn't to add stories and like stir around, but rather to use these stories that we talk about through the sources as a way to illuminate different aspects of the Canadian past and in doing so hopefully provide hints of what the Canadian present and the Canadian future might look like for students. Um, you can follow us on all these social media platforms and I know many of you have already and thank you so much because it is really exciting as we are moving to the end of the year to be able to see who is watching, who's thinking about it and maybe in the summer that you could um, pick up a few of the videos to be able to pick up a few of the videos like you're going to Blockbuster. Although if you do get this at Blockbuster, please send me a photograph <laughs> um, that you can watch some of these or listen to them on the podcast and think about how you might want to incorporate them into your classes for next year. Like I said, we do have a podcast with the audio version of these conversations. So please make sure to check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, these these uh, conversations are also completely available in French or English. If you press the closed caption, you can see the English subtitles, but you can also see the translated French subtitles. So that's really excellent. We also have reaction videos in French now, which is double excellent. And if you go on our website, we have resources in both French and English to support your teaching of this conversation. As always, I'm excited to um, have a conversation today. And today we are talking with somebody who I met on one of my favorite places. Ooh, that seems like I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. <laughs> one of my favorite places to connect with people, which is on Twitter. Today we're talking with Dr. Kai Pyle. They're at the University of Illinois and they are an expert in LGBTQ histories related to Indigenous people in the Great Lakes region. And so uh, they are right now at the University of Illinois, but they do research that does connect with this land called Canada, because of course the border between the U.S. and Canada is just a colonial border. People have been going back and forth across the border for longer than there was that border themselves. So we are talking with an expert who's able, that's going to be able to bring some of this, these ideas into our conversation. The second reason why I'm really excited is that we're going to be talking about a very colonial source. Um, but Dr. Pyle is going to be able to work with us through reading this source about how we can take some of these ideas related to decolonization, indigenization, to to a, a source that's very colonial in order to see it and read it differently than it was intended. And for that reason, I'm really excited for this because it's the method that we're really focusing on as much as the source itself. The third reason why I'm really excited about this talk is because through using that method, Dr. Pyle is going to introduce us to women and someone we might identify as transgender or two-spirit now, but identified as a woman in the source, um, uh, in history that we definitely do not talk about in our classrooms. And maybe we talk about the the man, the white man that um, wrote the source, but we often don't talk about these women that were around his lives. And to be able to just learn more about them, despite them not creating the record themselves, help us to, just like I um, talked about with Dr. Al Dejebi and Dr. Johnson for the Runaway Slave ad video, use our historical imagination to be able to to think more broadly about these people in the past that we don't have records for that they created themselves. So with that type of expertise, that methodology, those histories, I can't wait to go and uh, I can't wait to go and have this conversation. Before we go over to Zoom, make sure you like and subscribe and share. And let's just like get these conversations out there even more um, because it's been really exciting to get your feedback. And it's 
as exciting to have these conversations. And I can't wait to talk with Kai. Let's go over to Zoom. Kai, hello. Um, welcome to the series. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you. Before we get right into it, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so to just say a little bit about myself, um, my name is Kai Pyle. I um, I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I study um, Indigenous history in both the United States and Canada, um, specifically the history of LG, people we call LGBTQ or two-spirit Indigenous folks. Um, and I myself am from the Métis Nation and the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, um, so it's a subject that's very personal to me as well. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the other videos that I did was with the chair of transgender studies at the University of Victoria. And one of the things that we were talking about is that there are so few sources about um, LGBTQ plus people that we can use in the classroom that are digitized, but to kind of read back into history, because we're, we're not talking about the 1980s today, um, like to read back into history and to bring these histories together with histories um, of Indigenous people in North America is just really exciting. So thank you for bringing your expertise to our conversation. I'm very excited to talk about it. <laughs> Um, and the source that we're talking about today, you know, I think I said this to you, I was so surprised when you recommended it because I was like, we're talking about a book by that guy like that is not what I expected. So um, why don't we get right into it and you can tell us about the source. So what is the source that we are talking about today. So the source that we're talking about is the autobiography of a man named John Tanner. Um, and it's sometimes called the Falcon, which um, is a bad translation of his uh, Ojibwe name, his indigenous name that he was given. So John Tanner was uh, a young white boy in Kentucky um, who was captured by Ojibwe people in uh, the 1790s when he was about nine years old. Uh, and was then raised among Ojibwe and Odawa people um, for like the next 25 years of his life. And uh, after he kind of reconnected with the white American and Canadian world, he uh, collaborated with a botanist slash explorer slash physician to write this autobiography that tells the story of his life from the day he was captured um, to the present. And it's this incredible source that is just like really detailed. Um, it's like a year, year by year, season by season, blow by blow of his, um, of his life among Ojibwe and Odawa people. This is John Tanner as shown in the uh, front of his autobiography. Uh, in this picture, he is shown wearing European style clothing um, uh, in the, this is it was published in the 1830s. So that's kind of the time period the clothing's from. But in actuality, um, he strongly preferred to wear indigenous clothing um, even after he reconnected with white society because he said it was uh, white clothing was too uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, I'm like, that does not look like a comfortable outfit he's wearing, um, <laughs> but that's why I was so shocked when you suggested this. Cause when I saw the picture of him, I was like, like, th like this guy really. Um, and like even the period, right? Like when was the book written or when was the book published? So it was written in the late 1820s and published in 1830. Right. So right you know, about a decade or two before his death, like, that is not necessarily a period, like, yes, he rec like, he, what's what I'm looking for, he mirrors that period and how he looks, but the text itself demonstrates kind of so much a different reading of that period than the kind of colonial view that we will often ascribe to that period. Yeah, there's a, there's one scholar who actually, who has looked at, like, 
a bunch of different accounts of the fur trade in this era. And he describes John Tanner's book as the Indian side of the story, as opposed to how like these fur traders wrote their journals describing what was happening because John Tanner was living with other, with the indigenous people. And so he really has like that flip side um, in his perspective. When we're talking about John Tanner's book, whereabouts are we talking about? Where did he live? Like, where were they living? Where were they migrating? Um, do you have, I think you have a visual that you can show us? So I have a map. Um, this is from 1836, so around the time when the book was published. And um, it shows kind of the language families of the Indigenous people. So. John Tanner was born in kind of this area with the Shawnees below the Great Lakes. He was taken, um, and this is where Nitnokwe was from, from this kind of area where the three Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron meet. And most of the action of the book, though, takes place up here in this area between Lake Superior. Lake Winnipeg and like the Saskatchewan rivers. So that's that's where most of it's happening, the the kind of Great Plains and somewhat into the um, the bush areas. Great, thank you. So we are going to talk about uh, the, not the whole book, um, uh, even though the whole book, as as you said, that one scholar identifies it as like a like the Indian side, but we're actually going to go much deeper into just John Tanner's words, but rather like look at a couple different passages to be able to pull out some other stories, right? Yes. All right. So you picked out two passages for us and I'm going to go to screen share now to pull up one of them. Okay. So this is the first passage you picked up for us. Um, for anyone following along with their own copy of John Tanner's book, it's uh, page 47. Um, do you want to read this passage for us and then tell us about it a little bit? Sure. Our canoe had been lent to the traders and was sent on the route towards Red River to bring packs. As they were about to dispatch more canoes, Nitnokwe requested that they would distribute us about one or two to each canoe so that we might go on until we should meet our own canoe. After a day or two, we met the Frenchmen with our canoe, but as they refused to give it up, the old woman took it from them without their consent, put it in the water, and put our baggage on board. The Frenchmen dared not make any resistance. I have never met with an Indian, either man or woman, who had so much authority as Nitnokwe. She could accomplish whatever she pleased, either with the traders or the Indians, probably in some measure, because she never attempted to do anything which was not right and just. What is the other parts of the story that you want us to get from this um, passage? So important context for this passage is um, earlier in the book, we meet this woman named Netnokwe, who is the second family that adopts John Tanner. So he was initially um, adopted by one family who treated him very badly among the Odawa and then um, was adopted by Nitnokwe who had lost her own son. And um, one of the things that was common in indigenous communities in this time period was that um, children who had been killed in battle or killed in warfare um, could be sort of um, adopted then from other communities who other children who were seized in warfare. So John Tanner was kind of the replacement for um, her child and she had asked to adopt him. So she treated him very well and he clearly um, saw her in a very um, admiring light. She was referred to as uh, um, one of the principal chiefs of the Odawa, um, which sounds very important. Um, one of the things that is sort of a context that you can gain if you know a little bit of the indigenous languages that they spoke, which in this case was Odawa and Ojibwe, um, Nitnokwe would have been called an Ogimakwe, which was the word for a, a civil leader who is a woman. Um, and so, she um, was very powerful 
And um, in this case, um, they were in the process of moving to the Red River region. Um, they had just suffered a lot of tragedy, uh, Netnoque in particular, and um, were dealing with some Frenchmen who didn't want to give them their canoe back. And so what's interesting then is that that like the type of reverence, but also um, one of the things that I read here is like the sense of uh, the sense of like doing right and taking what they needed to be able to move forward in a in a really like just kind of no BS type of way, which is a, a really cool way to read that into this text because you wouldn't necessarily think, especially in this period, that there would be that type of like celebration of that strength of women in this time period or necessarily um, uh, toward people who are indigenous. Right, so it was, I would say it was not, um, there were not a lot of women who were, who held positions like this, but it wasn't uncommon. Whereas in like the Euro-Canadian world at this time, um, women could not hold political positions for the most part, um, aside from like the Queen Victoria at, in, a, in a slightly later period. Aside from like royalty, there was there were not political roles for women. Um, but in indigenous communities, in particular Ojibwe and Odawa communities, um, this was a role that women were able to take up. And um, and yeah, Netnokwe is someone who, in addition to just being to having that leadership role, it seems based on the description of like, because she never attempted to do anything which was not right and just um, and other descriptions, she pretty clearly was um, remarkable in terms of her personality and, um, and her attempts to just like do the, the right thing. And does Tanner talk about her more throughout the text? Yeah, so she is pretty prominent throughout the first half of the book, especially the first third when he's still in his kind of teenage years. And um, there's an extended period of time where um, after his adoptive father dies, Nenokwe's husband dies and her oldest son dies, they within like days of each other. Um, they are in a really tough situation uh, where they don't have someone to hunt for them. And so they rely a lot on Netnokwe to um, negotiate for their needs and to uh, take care of them. So uh, she's really prominent in that part of the book. Um, and then again, like she suffers a lot of hardship uh, in terms of losing family members, but also one of the, the things that I noticed throughout reading this is that we are constantly meeting new relatives of Netnokwe. Like there are so many individuals introduced in this book that are like referred to as, and then we met Peshabe, who was a relative of Netnokwe's. It's like, she's just got relatives all over the place, which in indigenous and Ojibwe and Odawa um, societies, kinship and family is super important, not just on an emotional level, but also um, in terms of determining your access to resources, your political um, uh, capabilities, all kinds of things like that. You know, like often I think of, because I'm in Ontario, I think of like the 1837 rebellion, which, you know, was like a drunken brawl outside of tavern. I mean, not quite, but um, and, you know, when we talk about like networks of power and things like that, it's so localized towards like white men that are trying to get type of like political and economic power in really formal ways. And I really love you bringing up Nick Nukwe in this, this text because of the ways that we can think about leadership and those networks of connections and power in in, in very indigenous ways and in different ways that kind of decenter us from just like the, you know, voting power or the legislature. Yeah, for sure. I think another thing that's interesting too is that Netnokwe does 
not really show up by name in many other accounts by Euro Canadian and Euro American uh, like fur traders or government officials. There are some references to like un they they never say the women's names in those in those sources. Um, they might reference an indigenous woman who has come to trade, but they don't say very much about her. And so having this source of Tanner who has kind of a, a weird insider and outsider perspective is really unique in terms of giving us this view that we might otherwise not have. Yeah, thank you. Because when I was going through the text, that wasn't necessarily the things I was looking for. So thank you for kind of bringing those things up. Okay, so this is the same book. We are now on uh, page 105 and we're gonna look at page 1062 again for all of you following along with your own John Tanner um, reading kit. Um, this source, this uh, passage is a little bit long, um, but you're gonna tell us a little bit about it right before we get into it. Yes, so this, uh, passage takes place around the year 1800. Um, John Tanner is approximately 20 years old, um, and uh, he and Netnoque and their family are currently in a, a time period of a lot of hardship in terms of not being able to get enough food. At this point, John Tanner is not really skilled as a hunter yet, and his brother is also not very skilled as a hunter. And so um, in the middle of this time when they're kind of almost starving often, they come to be visited by an individual named Ozawendib, um, whose name means yellow head. Um, and John Tanner is not very uh, complimentary towards Ozawendib. Um, he describes her as one of those men who makes themselves women and are called women by the Indians. Um, essentially what this means is Ozawandib is someone who was um, apparently appeared to be male at birth, but who lived most of her life as a girl and as a woman and apparently was accepted by indigenous, other indigenous people as being a woman in, um, as she identified and lived her life. She was also um, the daughter of a celebrated Ojibwe chief named Wishkobuk. Um, and uh, she said she, she arrives on the scene and informs, she, she informs John Tanner that she had come a long distance to see him and wanted to essentially marry him. Um, and John Tanner is, not excited about this. And it's really not clear why. Um, it's not entirely clear if this is because it's a sort of residue of his attitudes from being raised among um, white Americans, if this is something that um, kind of was an attitude he projected retrospectively when he was talking with the uh, the other man who was sort of writing down his story, or maybe possibly you know it's also possible that he was also like he was twenty years old and Ozawandib was nearly fifty at the time uh, and had had several husbands already. So there's a lot of like possibilities for why he is so uh, negative towards her. But what comes across is that he's horrified, but his adoptive mother, Nitnokwe, as actually um, thinks this is hilarious and really suggests that he should try to marry her. Um, and there's, I think this shows us a couple of things that um, are significant. One of them is that at this time, there was a lot of Indigenous women who ended up as wives of non-Indigenous men, um, usually fur traders. And so it's possible that Ozawandib may have um, probably heard that John Tanner was, um, was white and that um, because there was like sort of rumors going around about him, it seems at this time. And so it may have been that she um, was hoping he could kind of provide access to 
um, some kind of status or even like tangible goods. Um, but it, that's kind of speculation. Yeah. Okay. You just said so many amazing things there <laughs> because like, here's a person that may identify if they were living in the present as a transgender person. Um, they may identify as to spirit the way that we use it now. And that, um, you know, this line here, like, you know, there are several of this sort um, they are called women and, you know, it's definitely a way to like identify that, uh, like th this is normal for them, but it's weird for me. And the, like the normal for them part is just so fascinating. And I really appreciate you identifying like the, the very, you know, kind of rude discriminatory, um, ways that, John Tanner refers to her as creature and disgusting that it can come from a lot of different places, but not, it wasn't within that community themselves, right? Like there could be a lot of different ways and it could be that retrospective, which I think is so important to remember that this is not like a diary of that person's moment at that time, but rather this retrospective. Um, yeah, there's so many kind of fascinating things here. Yeah, it's a it's a packed story. Um, and I do think it's really important. This is a story that has gotten a lot of attention lately within Ojibwe communities and indigenous communities because it's such an evocative story about a historical figure who we might call two-spirit or transgender today. Um, and, and it's a record of the fact that even if John Tanner may have held certain prejudices, um, it seems pretty clear that the community that Ozawan did was a part of did not have those prejudices. This is her brother who was named, had the, held the same name as uh, their father, Wishkop, or Wishkopak, um, the sweet. Um, this was a painting done of him by someone commissioned by the government to uh, do paintings of different Ojibwe leaders. So it seems like uh, her brother took up that leadership position that their father had held. So this is as close as we can get as to seeing Ozawa Dib herself, unfortunately. You know, it's interesting because if this was created in 1836 and that other uh, image of John Tanner was, you know, like the 1820s or whatever, that this is, you know, the same time period and the different ways that these kind of leaders, these men are represented. But also when you're saying like these, these particular images were commissioned to show leadership and in talking about the ways that women's leadership uh, was not kind of recognized by the Euro-Canadian world in the same way they may have been doing within the indigenous nations, I think it's quite fascinating that we have an image of her brother, but not of herself, for example. Right. And there's no images of Nitnokwe either. So it's right. like, yeah, definitely the women were not seen as leaders by the people making these images. Okay. But there is a second part of the story, right? Can we screen share and you can tell, like, walk us through the second part of the story? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we've just turned the page to 106, and there's kind of a middle story that we're not going to talk about too much, but, you know, it's it's there. And I think we're going to talk more about this section, correct? Yes. So this comes right after a period of time when um, uh, John Tanner and Nokwe and their family are basically starving. Um, and... Uh, one day, Ozawandib whistles at John Tanner from the woods, uh, and he, he goes towards her and discovers that she has found a moose. Um, and John Tanner tries to shoot the moose twice uh, and totally fails. He hits the moose, but it gets away. And his mother, Nitnokwe, apparently... Uh, was not happy about this. She, it says she reproved me severely for this, telling me she feared I would never be a good hunter. But what happens next is kind of odd. 
from John Tanner's perspective, because he says, the next day we arrived at Wegado, who is one of Nitinokwe's uh, relatives and a, and a powerful chief himself. They arrive at his lodge um, and he says, I found myself relieved from the persecutions of the Agokwe, which is what he calls Ozawandib, um, which had been intolerable. Wegadot, who had two wives, married her. So from the perspective of how this is written, it's kind of very strange. Like what these things are happening in succession and there's not really a clear indication of like why. But I think what's interesting is if you sort of flip the perspectives and think about this from Ozawandip's perspective, she has just found a moose and basically presented it to John Tanner. And, and he fails to kill the moose. So he's just shown himself as not being a very good hunter, which is one of the main jobs of a an Ojibwe or Odawa man at this time. So it makes total sense from Ozawandip's perspective that as soon as they reach a place where there's someone more powerful who, who has proven himself to be a provider, which is Wekadot, um, that she's going to marry him instead of John Tanner. So John Tanner lost his uh, his shot here by um, literally losing, losing his shot. His shot. At the moves. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like to really, you know, I think that it kind of reads as these different incidents, right? That just kind of happen around the same time. And so I really love your reading into it to be like, no, 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 let's kind of connect these a little bit more. She was like, go get the moose. And he failed. And <laughs> She's like, oh, look, here's somebody that can provide and already has a big family. And that makes way more sense for me. Those were some really fascinating passages in John Tanner's book. And I know that people can like now kind of use this to think about other passages in the book, but to kind of think about our last question, you know, how can we challenge Canadian history with this source? But I think that the question is so much broader or like, you know, what is the this in that sentence is so much broader, like, you know, um, Indigenous history or an Indigenous reading or Indigenous readings of this history is one thing. Um, thinking about LGBTQ plus people, two-spirit people in the past is another. Doing this method of reading against the grain to think about um, women and two-spirit people uh, is another one as well. How would you kind of want teachers to think about how we can challenge Canadian history using a source like this? Yeah, those are all really um, great examples that, um, let me yeah, see like which no one pressure. I want to start That with. wasn't, you know, that was, no, that no, was no. just like, there's the bunny hill, ski down it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. First, I would say, yes, that um, when we look at history, Canadian history, from the perspective of Indigenous people, it really changes. Um, it changes also how we think about LGBTQ history. Um, it changes, you know, the, our perspectives on women's history. So in these two cases, we might often think of the early 1800s as a time period that was a time of um, persecution and powerlessness for women and LGBTQ people. Um, but if you look at this from indigenous perspectives, it's clear that in those communities, um, there was a lot of opportunity for women and, and two-spirit people to hold power, to, um, to determine their own lives. And um, so I think that's really valuable from um, a thing that we get from these sources that might present more of an Indigenous perspective. Yeah, like a way that I might say that to a teacher quickly too would be like, just because we live in a 
uh, Eurocentric patriarchal society dictated by capitalism and heteropatriarchy. So I actually, I don't think it's just going to be much shorter, even though that that's how we understand normal right now. And I say we in normal in very broad terms, that is not the way that we need to look back to the past or these sources, because that reading then reinscribes that same, those same power dynamics onto the past as well. Um, yeah, I think it's really, that's a really, it's a really like important way to think about how we can do the work of kind of decolonizing or indigenizing our histories, even if we don't feel like we are completely prepared for that. But those are some ways that we can kind of get into it, right? Yeah, I think the other thing I would say is that, um, like when you're talking about history, it's in, in times like these, um, it's often in the case that there aren't a lot of sources that come directly from, for example, LGBTQ people or indigenous people in these time periods um, for various reasons. So you have to kind of get creative in how you get at that history. And I think that looking at a story like um, Ozawindib and John Tanner and the Moose is an example of how you can look at something that seems like one thing, seems maybe confusing, straightforward, and by flipping the perspective you're looking at it um, and thinking about it from a different way, you can get that other perspective on, on what happened. You know, I immediately think of another video that I did with Dr. Funke Aladjebi and Dr. Michelle Johnson, who are Black Canadian historians who edited um, Unsettling um, the Great White North. That's the name of the book. Um, and they they uh, did a video with me where they looked at a, 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 an ad from a runaway about a runaway slave. And one of the things, one of the activities they talked about was like, use your historical imagination, which is going to show up as a, um, as a, a hashtag below, because I love that phrase so much to be able to think about the story within the story, like to get students to write the same story, but from the perspective of of somebody else that was there. And here I can even imagine like to like all of the different people or and animals that were there, like even write the story from the perspective of the moose that was just like, what did you just like get my like shoulder blade and now that's fine. I can walk away, you know? Um, but like to bring out all of that, all of those different elements of the story that aren't there, but that our imagination can help with. Yeah, definitely. And I think that this source, John Tanner's autobiography, is a great one for that because it's honestly full of people. Like, I, I think that this book should come with one of those kind of like lists at the beginning with all of the names that appear and who they are, because there's so many amazing sort of characters that show up yeah. in his life. Well, I mean, that's a good activity for a class too, right? To like, even just get people to like, give them a couple pages to identify who, who is re referenced in each page and in which way in order to bring those people out of the narrative rather than to be just like John Tanner's narrative. Yeah, exactly. Another thing that I really kind of think about as a way to challenge Canadian history is just to like, remember that LGBTQ plus people have always been here. <laughs> and, um, and that even though we can, just like you said, remember those narratives of like persecution and hiding, we can also remember that that is not the case for everyone across cultures or like as individual experiences. And that how does that open up our stories when we take that as a given rather than as an anomaly? Yeah, I think there is a tendency that we like to think in terms of progress narrative. So things were bad a long time ago and now they're better and in the future they will be even better and so on forever. And um, stories like this, like, like you said, there's, there are definitely the stories of dark times, but there are also these bright spots um, of, of like positivity and of interesting phenomenon. Um, and it makes history, I think, a lot more complex and 
interesting. And for students, I think it like it also may help them to think that, you know, the past was not all just dark times. Well, I think like that's such an excellent point about progress narratives because progress narratives in themselves are like Euro colonial constructions, right? And so if we are just thinking of history as marching towards a better future, we we then are really disrespecting all the experiences that came before, but also really not acknowledging how some things have gotten worse and that that's not necessarily how time works. Yeah, for sure. So Kai, this has just been so fantastic to talk with you. Um, how can people find you, get in, in touch with you? I know that you're working on a book, so it's not like we can buy your book right now, but uh, are there other ways that people can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, so I do have a website, um, which is, uh, you probably will need to put the uh, link in there because it's my Ojibwe name, which is makeadebenesique.com. <laughs> Um, okay, no, it's okay. I, uh, yeah, I can just spell that really quickly, but no, no, it is on the screen right now <laughs> and it is also down below the video. Awesome. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. My, uh, my username is Great Lakes Queer. Um, and yeah, I have a couple of, um, uh, articles that are available, like, um, publicly about Ozawindib. Um, so, uh, those are on my website as well. And I've gone through a few of them and they're really like accessible in terms of reading that even if you're not like doing a PhD, like it's very easy to understand and read through. Uh, so that's fantastic. Thank you so much. This was just really, really wonderful. Um, I hope we stay in touch and you know, we, we were saying before we started filming that you haven't been to Toronto, but I hope when you come here, we can get a chance to maybe continue this conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It was really great. Uh, and until next time, see you later. Hey everyone, we hope you enjoyed that video as much as we enjoyed making it. If you did, make sure you like below. Also comment and let us know how you're thinking of using this in the classroom. Uh, check out the playlist that we have specially curated for you so that you don't miss a video from this season or that you get to see other videos related to this topic that we curated especially for you. However, I also want you to subscribe. We're reaching the end of our season, but we have a whole new season coming out in September that we want to make sure that that you know about. We also have a whole series of videos coming out this summer called Short Stories Petite Histoire from community members who are showing you sources that you can use in your classroom. We know that summer's coming up and that you are going to need a break, but we're also going to have a no stress, no fuss, just go for a walk and do some thinking professional development. And we want to make sure that you know about that as well. So make sure you subscribe, like, comment, check out our playlist here, and keep an eye on all of our social media so that you know when our no stress, no fuss, just go for a walk and do some thinking, professional development starts for the summer. Have a great day.